The government creates new regulations to protect bank customers. Then banks slap consumers with new fees because of those very regulations. Now, the president's saying the best way to fix it all, a new consumer agency. Let's say the judge is fed up. Judge, you're fed up. Well, look, who, who should pay for the system by which we all use debit cards? The bank's not advancing us credit. It's giving us access through an ATM machine or through a merchant to our own cash. Well, for generations, the banks and the merchants had a relationship, an arm's length relationship. The merchant would negotiate with the bank what the cost was going to be, and that was a contract. Along came the Congress with an amendment offered by Senator Dick Durbin, who now apparently regrets it, that basically said to the banks, you can't enter into that freely negotiated for arm's length agreement with the merchants. We're not going to let you do it. So the banks decide, well, the merchants can't pay. The consumers have to pay. Then Dick Durbin says, take your money out of the bank if your bank is making you pay. The problem comes with politicians who think they can interfere with economic relationships and manage them better than the free market can. I didn't understand that, but I'm so angry after hearing it. <laughs> And what do they want to do? More regulations. No, well, that's, see, seriously, that's what I kind of understand, because then if, you're, if you want to create an agency to essentially oversee this sort of stuff, you're, you're going to make it more muckety, right? You are. And this regulation, that the banks cannot uh, be paid by the merchants for the use of the card, came about by an act of Congress. We don't even have the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in place yet. Once they get in place, they can write whatever regulations they want. They can micromanage any financial, financial institution they choose. You think Bank of America has problems today? Just wait till a few hundred more federal bureaucrats get their hands on it. And then they could be at cross purposes with one another. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, nice. So what does business do when it doesn't know what the regulations will be? It doesn't invest. You wonder why they're sitting on so much money. Or if you're the Bank of America, you cancel all their cards. Right. right. All right. Uh, Judge, thank you very, very much. A Detroit police officer is closer to trial after a botched SWAT team raid ended with the shooting death of a little girl while reality show crew recorded it. In May of last year, cameras were rolling as police raided a Detroit area home looking for a murder suspect. An officer's gun went off and this seven-year-old girl died, reportedly while asleep on the couch. Police say the officer's submachine gun fired accidentally. But the family claims that officer was careless, and they say police tried to cover it all up. Well, prosecutors have charged the cop with involuntary manslaughter and a show producer with perjury and obstruction of justice. With us now is the anchor of Freedom Watch on the Fox Business Network and Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. Of course, there's a video here. Right. Prosecutors have seen it. We're, Jeffrey Figer, the defense attorney here, claims he's seen it, right. but it's we have it. We haven't, and it's very unusual because the allegations are that the producer and the police were in cahoots to keep the video away from the prosecutor. The producer wanted to air the video because it is spectacular to look at. The police didn't want it aired because it may show evidence that would help convict this police officer. So the prosecutor has charged the producer with lying to a grand jury obstruct and obstructing justice by sending the police on a wild goose chase. For a while she claimed she didn't have it. But the prosecutor has seen it and as a result of what the prosecutor saw and revealed to a grand jury Grand jury of one person. It's the only state in the union. That's yeah, a grand jury that? of what's very odd. It's the European system, but it's permitted uh, under the Constitution and state courts. This one person grand jury decided to indict the police after the prosecutor asked the grand jury to do it. Second time in a month, we have seen prosecutors indict police for homicide committed during the course of their ordinary work. Hmm. Now, there are allegations that this officer, before he went inside this house, fired a gun through the window. That's the allegation from the family. And that it was that bullet which struck this seven-year-old girl who was sleeping on the couch. You know, Jeff Figer, whom I know very well, is not saying quite properly, he shouldn't say at no. this point, because the trial judge will decide whether or not the jury's going to see the video. So we don't know if the video substantiates right. uh, the police version, it was an accident, or the family version, he fired through the window. But we do know that the grand juror and the prosecutor have seen the video. So you could probably draw your own conclusions. It doesn't look good for the police. You know, I, as a young reporter and even more recently as an old reporter, you sometimes tag along with the cops and, and you always fear, you know, you hope, for, you hope you get something that brings truth to the screen, but the, the fear is always something's going to go bad. And I just wonder, 
if access is not going to be limited well, as a result. Well, you know, you see these, you see these shows on various uh, networks yeah, where they, they make money. Where they, they make a lot of money, and then you wonder, do the police do certain things because they know they're on television? Is, is justice being affected? Is government force being exercised because it looks better in front of a camera? Would they have done this if the camera wasn't there? Or, stated differently, if the camera had not been there, would we ever have proof of crimes committed by the police? So it cuts both ways. Of course, now everybody has a camera in his or her pocket, so it doesn't much matter. Yes. One most likely brought to us by Steve Jobs. Yes, like many other good things. Yep, yep, yep. Judge, thank you. Pleasure, Chef. Welcome back, everyone. Top Republicans in the House claiming Attorney General Eric Holder received not one, not two, but at least five memos, de <laughs> excuse me, detailing the Fast and Furious program that put guns in the hands of Mexican drug dealers. So why did he testify that he learned of the experiment a year after the date? On those memos. Joining us right now to talk about this unfolding scandal, Freedom Watch co-host uh, and co-host of the Five, Judge Andrew Napolitano. I'm only laughing because <laughs> Kilmeade moved his chair. I, 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 I was right. too far from Gretchen. All right, I don't blame you. I think it looks better with us now. So, Judge, uh, the, the president was asked this yesterday about his attorney general. He says, "I fully back him," but the more we learn, the crazier this is getting. I think that the president will find the need to withdraw from that statement that he fully backs him because Eric Holder has exposed himself to the potential for criminal prosecution. We've only had this one time in modern times when Richard Nixon's attorney general, John Mitchell, was prosecuted. Now, Eric Holder was not administered the oath to tell the truth when he testified before Congressman Issa's committee. You remember that famous question that Congressman Issa zeroed right in on? When did you first learn of this? Mm -hmm. And the attorney general hesitated and said, eh, probably a couple of weeks ago. We now know for sure that he knew about it a year before. So the issue is not perjury, because he wasn't under oath. The the issue is what the statutes call providing material misinformation to Congress, and the penalty for that is the same as perjury. But it's five years per lie. Okay, that's very interesting, but my other question is, so we know that he could be in trouble for that, but let's say he did know about it in May of 2010. Why does that make him in trouble? Because it's a preposterous and, uh, and negative way to enforce the law. And it was disastrous here because it resulted in the murder of a federal agent of one of the government's own employees. Right. A heroic young man who was patrolling the border ends up dead and one of the bullets in him came from one of these guns. And Judge, I just say that by reading between the lines from the investigators, it seems that we still have not gotten to the heart of what the meaning and goal and objective of this program was. I think that is that is going to be the, the stated gun. goal was to let the guns get in their hands so they could find out who they were and arrest them. Unfortunately, they lost track of the guns. There are hundreds of those guns, military grade guns out there, and we don't know who has them. All right. Have a great weekend, Judge. You too, guys. Tonight. Thank, thank you. you so much. What? Oh, thank God for Brian. Anyway, voters across the country are fed up with Washington. They're angry with the constant bickering. And in a recent poll, 79% say they are dissatisfied with the way the political system is working. But one of our Supreme Court justices, Antonin Scalia, says the gridlock is all part of the plan. I, I hear Americans saying this nowadays, and there's a lot of it going around. They, they talk about a dysfunctional government be, be, because there's disagreement, and, and, and they... And the framers would have said, yes, that's exactly the way we set it up. Uh, unless Americans can appreciate that and learn, learn to love the separation of powers, which means learning to love the gridlock. Love the gridlock. Uh, joining us right now is Fox News senior judicial analyst and anchor of Freedom Watch, Judge Andrew Napolitano, who put the fun in dysfunction. <laughs> Good morning, Good morning, guys. Guys. Yeah, how are you? Here's, here's what I think of that crazy oh, elbow that. system. Wow. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll take right. that any day. What's he talking about? Wow. Here's what he's talking about. He goes around the country. This is legal philosopher Antonin Scalia. This is not Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. Same person, obviously, but in a different role. It says to law students, why do we have liberty in this country? What's the greatest defense of liberty? And some say it's the Bill of Rights. And he says, no, it's just a piece of paper. And some say it's our American values. No, because our values could change with, uh, with mm -hmm. the wind. Time. The real reason we have liberty is because we have divided government, because the government is separated, because we have checks and powers, because the Congress can stop the president, because the courts can stop the Congress, because the states can do certain things that the federal government can't. And when people say we can't seem to get anything done, we can't seem to get it done fast enough,
And if Justice Scalia is arguing that was intentionally put into the Constitution so that the federal government would move slowly and methodically by consensus mm -hmm. and not in fits and starts in response to the immediate demands of the public. It's so interesting because when you look at the poll of how Americans feel, they, a lot of them, I think, well, they obviously don't like Congress, but they want to see things get done. But it's interesting that the Constitution still applies to 2011. It does. And, and the Constitution, when the Constitution was written, much of what the Wall Street uh, occupier crowd, or even people legitimately complaining want to see get done, was done by private business or by the states. Because the framers were afraid, too much central government, right. too little freedom, too little uh, opportunity for choice. And as the federal government took more and more uh, power, we get less and less patient with it. It still is intended to be slow and methodical so that we can look at these things sure. before we change the law. Well, uh, you know, uh, about a year and a half ago, we did change the law when it comes to health care reform. So, you know, the gridlock for a little while opened up and suddenly there's a big thing that's going to wind up in the lap of the Supreme Court. Because the health care reform is lawful in two thirds of the country and not lawful in one third because of the of the courts that have invalidated it. And the Supreme Court will have the final say. Why? Because the Congress can't write any law it wants. The Congress can only write laws that are consistent with the Constitution and the judiciary has the final say. So there's sometimes the gridlock lets up things go through and then they're settled by the Supreme Court. Yes, Steve. All right. Yes, Gretchen. Good enough. Thanks very much. We'll see you on your show <laughs> later on today. Okay? Our Bobby Sar and Shakuri are charged with conspiracy to murder a foreign official, conspiracy to use a weapon of mass destruction, and conspiracy to commit an act of international terrorism, among other charges. The Justice Department accusing the Iranian government of being involved in this major terror plot reportedly to assassinate the Saudi ambassador to the United States and bomb the Washington embassy. Attorney General Eric Holder calling it a violation of U.S. and international law. Judge Andrew Napolitano, my good friend, joins me now. Judge, uh, you have something with you that just broke. I, I have the document that was actually filed. It was just released about 15 minutes ago, Eric, and this is basically a complaint which is a statement made under oath by an FBI agent summarizing the evidence against these guys. We know that this so-called plot, I say so-called for explain to you in a minute, began in the spring of this year that the principal plotter was arrested two and a half weeks ago and the government for reasons not stated decided to make it make it public today. All right, now why so-called? Because this is a case in which the FBI found a naive person who thought that he could become a martyr and change the world by killing people and they encouraged him to do so they invited they wired uh, money to him uh, and they brought him along only to the point at which they knew they had to stop it before anybody got hurt All right judge this is the suspect this is the uh, the guy the US I guess he's a US citizen with an Iranian passport I believe yes. that's what it is yes. his name is Mansoor or Bob CR and he was in court a couple of minutes ago and there's a sketch of it now he judge if the man admits to it how is it still a, a suspected plot? Is this not a, a, an act of war? Well, it's not an act of war because the government chose not to involve the Defense Department. The government chose to keep this, it's a great question, Eric, to keep this within the confines of the, uh, of the, just, of the Justice Department. The Defense Department's not involved and they brought him before a federal judge. If this were an act of war, he would be un under the present state of the law, whether it's constitutional or not is another story. But under the present state of the law, if this was an act of war, he would have been brought to Guantanamo Bay and charged before a military tribunal. What took him so long to arrest this guy? Well, they're, they're, it's very curious as to the the timing because he was arrested on September 29 he's been incarcerated since then the government chose to reveal the existence of the plot today now today is the day that congressman Issa Republican of California mm. announced he's going to subpoena mm. the Attorney General to testify before the House of Representatives to whether or not he lied about fast and furious the selling of, of guns to Mexican drug gangs perhaps the Attorney General I'll say this Eric wanted to get that his own personal legal problems off the front page they could have revealed this two weeks ago and they time. could have revealed two Any weeks time. from now but yes. they chose today when we hear that uh, ISO was allegedly going to hand a subpoena to to holder there are two other people involved there in Iran the American is in jail here in New York City safe from where he can produce any harm Judge Andrew Napontal. That's some breaking news right now. Fox News confirms now that the subpoenas are now out for the Attorney General and members of his staff. 
uh, in the Department of Justice, all this relating to the Fast and Furious investigation. There are members of Congress who believe the Attorney General may have either misled or flat out lied as to when he knew about the program underway. I want to bring in the judge, Anna Napolitano, when this breaking news, Fox News senior judicial analyst and host of Freedom Watch on Fox Business Network. How you doing, Judge? Good, Bill. How does the subpoena now change the course of this story or in this investigation? Well, it makes it a lot more serious because when Congress sends a subpoena, serves a subpoena on someone, no matter who they are, even the President of the United States, if you recall what happened to President Nixon when he attempted to avoid or evade a subpoena, Congress invokes the power of the federal courts in Washington, D.C. to enforce the subpoena. There's very little wiggle room here. There's very little opportunity that the attorney general has to avoid complying with the subpoena. And it's out, as William Lajeunesse has reported. I just saw it. It's com comprehensive. It demands tens of thousands of pages of documents. The only way that the attorney general can decline to produce those documents is to invoke executive privilege, which means he discussed the issue in the documents with the president. So the only way he can avoid complying with the subpoena is to throw his boss under the bus. Don't look for that well, to happen. So short of that, then, at some point, Eric Holder is going to be back before that committee on Capitol Hill answering questions. After the staff has gotten the 10,000 or more documents and examined all of them, then they will summon the attorney general back and say, when you told us you just learned about this three weeks before we asked you, did you know this, 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 and this? Because we have all these emails showing that you received mm -hmm. this information. Got it. Okay, from yesterday's press conference, now, this was called for a different event. It was the, uh, the threat on um, a certain interest in Washington, D.C., launched by Iranian forces. Right. That was the topic for the press conference. At the very end of it, the Attorney General was asked about this. We have sent thousands of pages of documents up to the Hill. We'll look at the subpoenas. I'm sure we will undoubtedly comply with them. But what I want the American people to understand is that in complying with those subpoenas and dealing with that uh, inquiry, that will not detract us from the important business that we have here to do with the Justice Department, including matters like the one that we have announced today. Thank you. That was the end of the press conference, essentially. You, right. you think you can make an argument? that that news from yesterday with regard to Iran and Saudi Arabia was designed to blunt the news or the subpoena or the issue itself? At the very moment that he was holding that press conference yesterday, a 40-page document was being filed in the United States District Court in Manhattan, which is simply an affidavit by an FBI agent swearing to the truthfulness of everything in it. That affidavit reveals that what they revealed yesterday, they have known for the past 11 days. No, no problem so far. But that means they could have revealed the information yesterday, that somebody was attempting to kill the Saudi ambassador to the United States in Washington or in New York and blow up embassies and kill innocents as well. Anytime they wanted in the past 11 days or in the succeeding 11 days. Now you could, but I could argue that there's still a man at large and that was going to blow a hole in the investigation if you go public with it. Well, the man at large is in Iran and we don't have an extradition treaty with Iran and short of invading Iran, there's no practical way of getting him. So the question is, did they reveal this yesterday, the day the subpoena was announced, in order to blunt or dull the effect of the subpoena or did they reveal it yesterday okay. because that was the day it should hold, have been revealed? Hold that argument. With question. If the police arrest you for a minor, nonviolent offense, and they do not suspect you of hiding any weapons or any drugs or anything else of any danger, should guards at the jail be allowed to strip you naked and search you, including a cavity search, as they might say where the sun doesn't shine? That's where the U.S. Supreme Court is weighing in now, in a case which looks at the line between security and rights of privacy and protection from unreasonable search. It all started of all places in the great state of New Jersey, where cops wrongly arrested a man for supposedly an unpaid fine. As it turned out, he had paid the fine, but he spent six days in two separate jails, and in each of them, officers stripped him naked and searched him every which way. With us now is Fox News senior judicial analyst and host of Freedom Watch on the Fox Business Network, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Sure. All right, this was like a parking ticket. Yes. And he goes to jail the first time, they strip everything off, search him every which way. He goes to another jail, stripped him naked, search him every... The heart of this goes to what's known as government immunity. Mm -hmm. The government admits that the strip searches were improper. The government admits that this was a perfect storm 
of inappropriate behavior. The government claimed it thought he still uh, was the subject of a warrant in another county, even though he had written proof in his pocket that that warrant had been satisfied, that a fine he was supposed to have paid two years ago has, had been paid. The government admits that it touched him inappropriately, that it confined him for seven days, six nights, for a, 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 an offense not coming to a complete stop at a stop sign for which no jail time is permitted. But the government says it's allowed to make those mistakes. He says, you can't do this. You can't take my freedom away from me for something that I couldn't have been sentenced to jail for even if I had been found guilty of it. Supreme Court will decide whether or not he can tell this to a jury and whether New Jerseyans on that jury will decide this is the way the government should treat people. You were on the New Jersey Superior Court. Right. What is your sense of how the Supreme Court's going to rule on this matter? It's a very interesting case because it was filed in federal court. It was not filed in state right. court. The allegations violates the federal constitution. I think the Supreme Court, which didn't have to take this case but did take it to overturn the lower court, which threw the case out, will send it back to a federal court in Newark, New Jersey and say, let a jury of 12 people decide if this is the way the state should treat people. Now, there's a lot of racial issues here, right. with tremendous racial overtones. He's African-American. The cops were white, so there were allegations of racial uh, animus. He carried around with him this piece of paper saying, I'm not the same guy you're looking for in Newark because I've been stopped before by other <laughs> cops who stopped me because I drive a late model car. They wouldn't hear any of it. Let a jury decide who's right or wrong. We'll, let, we'll see what the Supreme Court says. Judge Napolitano, welcome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me in this beautiful studio. It's bad. It's Gorgeous. bad. Isn't it? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Judge. When you say it's bad, you mean it's good. Oh, I do. <laughs> I almost messed up again. I do that, Judge. <laughs> the man who's companion disappeared while he was away on holiday, on vacation, I should say, in Aruba, today asked for a uh, get-out-of-jail-free card from judges there. The answer was no. But the options now for prosecutors are quite limited. Let's take it to our Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. He's the host of Freedom Watch on the Fox Business Network. They, yeah. they have different rules, but if you don't have enough to charge them, you don't have enough to charge them. Well, right. I mean, here, here's the dilemma faced by the judge. First of all, the hearing is in secret because he's looking at actual evidence, and they don't want to reveal what the evidence is until they charge him, if at all. So the prosecutor may say, look, we're waiting for these toxicology tests or this handwriting test to come back from Holland and it's online and it's ready to be tested and we can't we can't speed it up so you need to give us the time to wait for it to come back that rings very well with the judge it's it's a neutral reason and it makes sense why they need a little bit more time but they have a law as phil keating said they have sixty days at the end of the sixty days they can't just say we need another thirty they have to give a reason of something they expect to happen in the next thirty days in order to keep him so the judge has viewed something in private that has caused him to say I'll let you keep him another two weeks and we'll look at it again at the end of the month. But there's a heavy burden on you at the end of the month. You have to show me that you have some evidence sufficient to charge him and that if charged he can be convicted on it, otherwise I'm going to let him go because that's the law. Our correspondent on this, Phil Keating, is still with us from our South Florida newsroom. And Phil, I'm, cur I'm curious if we have any idea what this thing is, this bit of information that is not yet made public or if that's just very well kept secret. Well, I think it's uh, primarily the laptop and cell phone data that's being forensically analyzed by the experts over in the Netherlands, and it's just a time issue on getting that back in. The FBI has been working uh, with the Aruban authorities, uh, searching his home in Maryland. Mm -hmm. They did obtain some handwriting samples, and that is going to be used for this life insurance, the traveler's insurance that Aruban authorities say Gary Giordano took out on Robin Gardner's life at the airport or when they bought the tickets to fly from uh, the U.S. down to Aruba. Of course, uh, he, right before he was arrested, he was at the airport attempting to board a flight to return back to Maryland. And uh, according to reports down there, when the detectives approached him at the Aruba airport, right. uh, he, was, he was absolutely sweating. You, you know, Judge Napolitano, there, a lot of people have questioned whether, in light of all the bad publicity Aruban authorities got in the wake of the Natalie Holloway investigation, whether they're just doing anything they can to try to put pieces of a puzzle together that for the moment at least don't exist. Well, they may w very well be doing that. I want to don't want to say that their behavior is is inappropriate, but they certainly have this monkey on their backs, which is the terrible, terrible reputation that they have because of their inability to follow through on uh, on the Natalie, Natalie Holloway case until Joran Vandersloot uh, got involved in some other criminal activity uh, in another country. So they're going to be a lot more thorough and a lot more aggressive 
aggressive uh, than they have in the past. But as Phil just indicated, some of these time issues, how long it mm -hmm. takes to get information to the judge, are out of their control. Judge Napolitano, Phil, thank you both. You Pleasure. can watch The Judge weeknights on the Fox Business Network. Freedom Watch airs 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 Central. And if you don't get the Fox Business Network, you should demand it.